Good evening and welcome to Road Trip Criminals, episode three. Uh, this is the show where we cover uh, one crime from every state in the United States. And today we're covering Arizona. That's right. And before we uh, get into the not so fun stuff, uh, what are some facts about Arizona? Yeah, let's do some fun facts first. So, Arizona is, I think, believe, the first state we've covered that has an official nickname. So Ooh. that's a little fun. Uh, the the official that's nickname. Third time's charm. <laughs> You're right. Uh, the official nickname is the Grand Canyon State. So not super exciting, sense. but it yeah. makes sense, right? Also, their motto is in Latin, but in English, it means God and riches. So that's cute. Nice. Um, but as for some other fun little names that they've gone by or, or people know them by, since the Grand Canyon State is so obvious, <laughs> since yeah. they have the Grand Canyon. Not a lot of thought went into that. Well, so I'll, I'll kind of explain a little bit how nicknames are actually picked, I guess, for each state. Um, mm -hmm. so at least for like official nicknames, um, right. But they have their nickname, or maybe, you know, unofficial ones as well. They're they're picked from things that they're known for, right? So, like, some sort of historical sure. event. So, like, with Alabama, it was the Yellow Hammer. Um, mm -hmm. And that was to do with the Civil War. Or um, an notable landmark, which for Arizona is the Grand Canyon. <laughs> um, yeah. Or there's some sort of, like, cultural meaning to it. Or even has to do with the climate. So... That would be mm -hmm. more like, uh, you know, Alaska and stuff like that, where they had all sorts of nicknames sort of related to, to the frontier or to the, uh, oh, what was it? The Midnight Sun. That sort of thing was there. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. So. Yeah. And then, and then there are some, because I don't know a whole ton of these, but then there, there are definitely some where it's like, they make no sense. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's true. <laughs> like New York being the Empire State. Well, that's based off the Empire State Building, right? Or was it the other way around? Oh, maybe. <laughs> what, yeah, that's I don't know. What I, I haven't gotten. I don't know. I haven't gotten to New York yet, so I couldn't tell you. I'm only. Right. <laughs> Arkansas is like that too, but I won't say it because since that's next week. That is next week. But yeah, we lived there, so I know what it is. Right, and I can explain more into that next week because I have all these fun little explanations for them. Which brings me back to Arizona and their fun little facts tell as me well. More. Yes. So, another little. Nickname for them is the Copper State, uh, because they have quite a bit of copper stuff there. You could consider the the oh, copper yeah. color of their dirt. Um, yeah, I was gonna say it's real, real red and orange over there. Yeah, Never and they been. actually they have the uh, the copper colored star on their flag, right? So <laughs> fun little thing there. So <laughs> they're also known as the Valentine State, which is because. Huh. Arizona gained their statehood on February 14th, 1912. So it was a very romantic day uh, yeah. and happy celebratory day for Arizona. Maybe it's just because I'm in the morbid mindset, but my first thought was like, was my bloody Valentine film today? <laughs> a little bit before that. A little bit before yeah, that. Yeah, my, my brain was also in the mindset of uh, like coal mine. Right. Like mines just from the copper and right. that's about a mining town. Yeah. And so I think <laughs> my uh my brain sorta made the through line. Yep. I love that movie. I don't even know where it takes place though. <laughs> no, well, there you go. Oh, their state mammal is the ring tailed cat. Which Okay. Is that one of those desert cats? Could be. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um their state flower is the Saguaro cactus blossom. So the that cactus is those big tall ones with the arms that you always see in like the movies or animation or stuff or about deserts, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, the state reptile is the Arizona ridge-nosed rattlesnake. So also makes sense. It makes a ton of sense. Um, yeah. The state tree is the uh, Palo Verde, which is sounds cool. I believe it, it's sort of like a, a maybe not a, a palm tree, but along that sort of line. You know what I mean? Yeah, and the family. Yeah. And I guess uh, we'll end these little fun facts on, on this last one. Their state firearm is the Colt Single Action Army Revolver. You know, so. that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> right? Arizona's one of the, the hearts of the Wild West, and exactly. Colt Revolver's the uh, 
the signature of that time period. So right, exactly. So that's uh, that's gonna be all the fun facts this time. So we'll go ahead and cool. get into the not so fun facts. Tell me about crime. I will. <laughs> so this week we'll be talking about the Pied Piper of Tucson. So obviously this takes place in Tucson, Arizona. That. Yeah. Um, fan of the fi- fan of the Pied Piper. Oh yeah. Uh, maybe not so much this one. Good but story. We'll see. <laughs> Probably not this one. So Pied Piper also has a pretty bad track record, especially with kids. So yeah. Well, okay. Well, Probably well, won't enjoy this one. Well, <laughs> less kids this time, more teenagers. We'll put it that way. Oh well, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> um. So he actually didn't get his nickname until he was on trial. So I'm gonna go ahead, gonna go ahead and jump in and just tell y'all who he is. Um, okay. So full name, uh, Charles Howard Smitty Schmid Jr. is his name. I will be calling him Smitty because it's fun to say. So he was born on July 8th in 1942. He was an illegitimate child um, and was adopted by Charles and Catherine Smid, who owned and operated the Hillcrest Nursing Home in Tucson when he was only a day old. So that's why he has the same name as his adopted father. Unfortunately, he never really got along with his adopted father. Um, Shame. And they frequently fought. Um, you'll see this in a little bit, but he, he seemed to have an issue with authority, it seems like. Um, cool. And I believe he got along much better with his adopted mother because she seemed to just kind of go along with whatever he said. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> as he was growing up, he was given quite a bit of leeway by his adopted parents. I mean, even when he was younger, he was frequently sort of causing trouble and getting into mischief and seemed to really want attention on him. Right. When he was a teenager, I can't find an exact age, but he was still a teenager. He was, uh, his adopted parents gave him to, uh, an extra like cottage they had on their property and he stayed in that. He lived in there um, while he was only a teenager. That's pretty cool. Right. Um, and he used that little cottage, that house, to have parties and sex and drink without his parents knowing. So right. um, Didn't use it too well, but no. independence is good for a, a, a teenager. Maybe not this teenager, though. Well, you know, it didn't work out well, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he was also given an allowance that was somewhere around $300 a month, which... Assuming this was around 1960, it would currently be around $2,600 a month. Uh, Jesus. Right? Apparently, running a nursing home pays very well. It's more than I make in two months. <laughs> oh, goodness. So he started getting that when he was about 16. They also gave him a new car and a motorcycle. So they just were Dang. very generous people, apparently. Very, yeah. very kind to him very nice to him would give him whatever he wanted or needed but didn't seem to help him out very much apparently not so in school wasn't a great student not very surprising since he was sort of a a jokester right they tend to be they tend to struggle a bit right not all of them but as a stereotype but he excelled at gymnastics um, Hmm. because he was very short he was either 5'3 or 5'4, which, as a fellow shorty, I would give him 5'4, but since he's a murderer, I'm going to take that away and say that he's 5'3. That's shorter than my girlfriend. <laughs> but taller than me. So. Taller than you. <laughs> but, as I said, he was an excellent gymnast. He actually brought his school to the championships in 1960, uh, where he won the flying and still rings and came in second in the long horse uh, and he also took fifth place in the horizontal bars. But so he was good at this. <laughs> he was an excellent gymnast. Short people tend to be, but he was excellent at it. But he gave gymnastics up his senior year for some reason. Mm-hmm. Shortly before graduation, he decided that he was going to steal some tools from the school. And uh, Not usually smart. No, he was suspended. and That'll happen. Yeah. Even though he was allowed to re-enroll, he never went back to school. So he dropped out right before graduation. It's not smart. No. After he dropped out, he never got a job. He lived off the allowance that his parents gave him. 
He stayed in that house that on their property that they allowed him to stay in. And I mean, instead, I can't blame him for that. But. I mean, it's fair, but still. <laughs> I mean, hey, free living. You know. I guess. I'd still, I'd get bored, but whatever. Yeah. Um. I mean, find a job, but. Right. I mean, it, hey, right. If you don't have to pay rent. Exactly. Like right out of high staying school, staying in the house and and getting that extra allowance is very nice. Um, but I would definitely get a job if nothing else but to have something to do. Right. Um, but he would spend his time cruising the speedway, which was a main drag there in Tucson, uh, picking up girls and drinking. It was it super. Sounds. Well, unfortunately, he was into uh, teenage girls. So. <laughs> not so cool. <laughs> not so cool. Um. <laughs> He actually hung out 18 by this point. At this point, he'd be around 18 and he only gets older from here and never stops hanging out or dating teenagers. Uh Oh, yep. Uh, so he actually, most of the people he hung out with was the teenagers because he was seen as sort of a cool dude who was there Mm -hmm. for the misfits and everything like that. So Mm -hmm. it it was mostly teenagers (laughs) when he was 21. That's when he found out that he was adopted. So he asked his adopted mother, who told him the name of his birth mother, and he went to find her, which he did, and she immediately went, fuck off, I don't want to see you, I didn't want to see you when you were born, I don't want to see you now. So, a little hurtful. a good thing to tell your son. Yeah. It usually ends well. Absolutely. Um, so, Smitty seemed to go a little little odd after high school during high school or or school in general he was fairly normal uh looking but afterwards he uh he changed his appearance quite a bit so he had a i would say he'd had short man syndrome he was (laughs) sensitive um i would say that a lot of this incident was caused due to that but (laughs) we'll get to that so he started wearing oversized cowboy boots which he stuffed with crushed cans and rags. So he added three more inches to his height. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, he wore dark tan pancake makeup, which I don't wear makeup. So I had to ask mom what pancake makeup was. But it's apparently that the the flat, you know, makeup, round makeup um, mm-hmm. that you like pat on. But yeah. he wore it darker tone than his skin tone so he, he made his himself look a, a darker tone than he actually was mm-hmm. um he either either wore white lipstick or so much chapstick that his lips looked white okay yeah and he created a mole um for his cheek that was made out of putty and axle grease okay yeah and his friends said um, that as time went on, it seemed to get bigger because I, and I believe it. Cause I saw, I was looking at pictures of him as I was doing research and some of them, they looked right. like a fairly regular size. And then by the end, when he was arrested, he was also wearing a bandage on, bandage on his nose at that point. Um, because he was telling people okay. his nose was broken. So he has some really wild looking pictures at that point. So he has a bandage on his nose and the, uh, mole that he's created is, Half the size of his cheek at that point, it looks like. It's disgusting looking. Ew. <laughs> yep. So It's a lot of axle grease. Yeah. It's um, not good for the skin. No. Oh, well, he was probably wearing so much makeup, he probably never touched his skin. Anyway. You know, one can hope. <laughs> so, he was a big old fan of Elvis, as many people were that back then. That's not surprising. So, he dyed his, he had reddish brown hair, he dyed it black and slicked it back. He apparently also used a clothespin on his lip to make it look droopier, to make it kind of give it that Elvis droop. <laughs> okay. Yep. So he was, he was a weirdo. He was a character. <laughs> yes. So now we're into 1964. He's drinking uh, with mm-hmm. his friend John Saunders, who's 18, and his okay. girlfriend at the time, Mary French, who was 17. Yikes. Yep. Um, but he, he, you know, they've been drinking, and mm-hmm. Smitty just goes up, tells him, he wants to kill a girl, see how it feels, because he knows how, that he'll be able to get away with it. So, uh, they... Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yep. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Unfortunately, 15-year-old, blonde-haired, blue-eyed Eileen Rao, sorry, Rowe, had caught Smitty's eye. She had also apparently stood John up for a date before, so he was also on board with killing her. So, mm-hmm. not great. Um, That's a good reason. Right. Uh, she had only moved to Tucson the year before with her mother, uh, who had recently divorced. So it was just her and her single mother. Mm-hmm. She actually knew John and Mary. They went to the same high school. They went to Palo Verde High School. Smitty attended, okay. had attended uh, Tucson High School. There's a lot of high schools in Tucson, apparently, even in the 60s. Well, in the 60s, even. But Mary also lived four doors down from Roe and was friends with her. And John lived a couple of blocks away from her house and was acquainted with with the Roes, with her family. So they knew each other before all this. Roe was academically successful. She had above average grades and she wanted to become an oceanographer. Hmm. But back to... Wanting to kill her. Smitty told Mary to go convince Roe to go on a double date with John and Smitty and Mary. So Mary approaches her and Roe refuses. Probably for the best. For the best. However, Smitty was undeterred. He, and I saw, yes, I saw some people saying he was calling Mary and some, pe- some people said that he was calling Roe. So he was calling one of the girls but mm-hmm. constantly the next day and trying to convince Rao to go out with them <laughs> and hang out. However, Rao continued to refuse. Mm-hmm. So after a while, Smitty was getting real frustrated because he wanted to kill someone that night. So he told Mary to find someone else. <sighs> okay. Yep. Unfortunately, Mary couldn't find anyone else, or I guess fortunately, uh, Mary couldn't find anyone right. else. So she tried Rao. Ro, one more time. Mm -hmm. And this time Ro agreed. But said that they had to wait until her mother, who was a a night nurse at the Tucson Medical Center, went to work. Mm -hmm. So, on Sunday, May 31st, 1964, at 9.30pm, Ro's mother leaves for work and believes that Ro is in bed. Okay. Smitty, John, and Mary park about a block away from Ro's house and... When they see Rose's mother leaving, Mary goes up to Rose's window to get her. So Rose goes with them. She's wearing a black swimsuit with a yellow checkered dress over it with, and curlers in her hair. Okay. Why not? Sure. So the group travels to an area in the desert near the intersection of South Harrison and East Gulf Links Road, which is a place that Smitty liked to go and drink and make out. Okay. So... They walk a bit further into the desert until they come to, like, a washed-out creek bed sort of area uh, where they Mm -hmm. sat and talked. A little bit later into the night, Mary returns to the car, starts listening to the radio, while the boys do some crime. (laughs) Okay. So, the men tie Rose, uh, Rose, goddammit, Rose hands behind her back with a guitar string. And then either both of them or just Smitty rapes her before Mm -hmm. they smash her head in with a rock. So after that, John goes back to the car to get Mary and the shovel that they had placed in the trunk before all this started. Mm -hmm. John and Mary return to where Ro's body is. They bury Ro in a shallow grave and they bury Smitty's bloody shirt uh, and the shovel nearby. Then they all return to the car and create a story in case they're questioned. Mm -hmm. So they decided to say that uh, Ro agreed to go out with them um, or go out with John. But then when they went to pick her up, she hadn't been home. So basically saying that she had already been missing by the time they went to see her. Right. So the next morning, Monday morning, Ro's mother returns from work. And assume that Roe is at school. But that afternoon, her mother gets the call gets a call from the school saying that Roe hadn't been at school all day and alerted the authorities. So she alerted the authorities. Okay. The police couldn't find a whole lot of clues because, you know, up to a certain point she had been going willingly, right? So there wasn't evidence right. of struggle or anything like that. 
Mm -hmm. um, but Rose's mother didn't believe that she had run away because she hadn't taken her purse or any clothes with her, except for what she had on whenever she left, which was a swimsuit, a dress, and curlers. So, right. Rose's mother did tell the police that before she had disappeared, her daughter had told her that Smitty, Mary, and John had a gang and that Ro didn't want to get involved with their parties because they involved sex, alcohol, and drugs. And she didn't want any of that. Right. Smart. Right. So, Rose's mother demanded that the police question Smitty. So, mother had a good instinct there. Yeah. <laughs> you right off yeah. the bat. So, they did bring him in, along with Mary and John, uh, for questioning. But they all had the same story, right? They went over that. So, mm. they couldn't be held, and they were released. And in right. the end, the police assumed that uh, Roe was just another teenage runaway. Mm -hmm. So, you'd think, you know, oh, he gets he murders someone, he gets pulled in for questioning, all that. Somebody would be on the down low. Well, doubt it. Nope, not Smitty. He bragged to his teenage group that of the murder, um, no and apparently, at least thirty teenagers knew about it at the time, but no one alerted the authorities. Remember uh, last episode when I talked about how most uh, most of the time when people confess to other people, it's mm -hmm. not true. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> like, well, you see, you just hadn't right, met the right person yet. I mean, he's just asking for it. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> you can tell 30 people one of them's going to talk. Well, none of them did. He had his own little teenage cult going on because he slept Apparently. with all the women and all the guys thought he was cool. It was, it was wild. Like, if he decided yeah. to do something else with his life, he could have been a cult leader, I guess. Yeah, that's always a better option. <laughs> this is how he ended up with the, the name the Pied Piper of Tucson, is because for some reason, even with all his weird stuff going on, he was very charismatic, and people mm -hmm. followed him. So, Apparently so. Yeah. Very, very odd. <laughs> yeah, a bit. <laughs> anyway. So, after Roe's murder, John left to join the Navy. And so, Smitty gets a new friend. Or, maybe not a new friend. I saw conflicting information. Some saying that um, this guy, Richie Bruns, I believe his last name is, um, who is 17, by the way. He's, he's also a teenager. Um, of course. Yes. I so, figured. Right. Um, but something said that they had known each other since they were, like, young and some said they had just met each other. And I lean hmm. more towards that they had just met each other because he he's still a teenager. And that's just the group that Smitty hung around. So right. unless they had by they had known each other for a while, it was that Richie had been in the group, the group of teenagers for a while. For a while. Yeah. yeah. And how old's old Smit at this point? Uh this was nineteen sixty four. And he was born in 42. So give me a second. <laughs> Try to so, do some math. 22. Somewhere around there. He's in his 20s. Mm -hmm. Um, He should not be hanging around teenagers, but... <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> there he is. Still hanging around teenagers. Anyway. So, Richie Bruns is Smitty's new friend that he's made. New best friend mm -hmm. since John left. So in July of 1964, Smitty noticed 16 year old Gretchen Fritz. She was at a swimming pool near the Speedway, which is where he hung out with the teenagers. The weirdo. Uh -huh. Anyway, um, so Gretchen was the daughter of a heart doctor. Um, so her family was pretty well off. But Gretchen was, was the wild child of the family, right? Mm -hmm. She was unimpressed by boys, and thought prostitutes had the right idea by charging them for sex. Her school recommended okay. that she... Yeah. <laughs> her school <laughs> recommended that she see a psychiatrist before she was suspended, before they suspended her. Smart. Uh, yeah. Uh, she often cut class to cruise the speedway, so that's probably why she was there. Well, no, this mm -hmm. was July, so it would be summer break, so she was fine. Right. Um, 
She was also suspected to be involved with some minor crimes in the area. She was one of those, you, you know, a lot of times rich kids just tend to act out. Yep. That's Gretchen. <laughs> so the way that Smitty woos Gretchen is that he follows her home. And, um, Always a good start. Right. And then brings just a ton of pots and pans with him and pretends to be a traveling salesman. So, okay. Yep. So he keeps that up for a little bit before dropping the charade and um, confessing to her that it was an act to, you know, get to know her. Uh, mm-hmm. And somehow that worked and they ended up dating. Hey, you know... <laughs> It's the old saying, when a pots pots and pan seller comes knocking, fuck him. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, uh, sure. Yeah. yeah. So, as we know at this point, uh, Smitty cannot stop talking. Um, he also tells Gretchen about killing Ro. Of course. Of course. Um, so, unfortunately for Smitty, him and Gretchen didn't have the best relationship. Uh, Shocking. Right. So they were constantly arguing because Smitty was seeing all kinds of girls (laughs) all the time, even though he was allegedly dating her, right? Right. Um, Gretchen was apparently well known to be incredibly jealous, so not a good move on his part. Right. He had apparently uh, proposed to Mary French at this point and some other girl. Like, he had proposed to them at about the same time. And okay. then he was also dating Gretchen. So, I, plus I'm sure he was sleeping around with some other girls, too. It was it was a big old mess. Smitty's just a mess. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, he. I can't deny that. <laughs> <laughs> My, okay, yeah, continue. <laughs> okay, if you're sure. Gretchen threatened to spill the beans about Rose murder. Mm-hmm. Um, as she should. As she should. Uh, as Although she shouldn't should. threaten, she should just she, spill. Right, yes. Someone should. There's enough people that know at this point. Yeah. <sighs> anyway. So, around the 1st of July in 1965, she also allegedly stole Smitty's diary, where he had allegedly... Um, written about murdering a 16-year-old boy who was going out with one of Smitty's many former girlfriends. Um, Apparently, after he was dead, Smitty had cut off his hands and buried him in the desert. All right. Which, this was actually similar to something Smitty had told others in the past. Not surprising. Um, And Smitty later admits to one more murder than they have on him. Uh, So, some believe that he actually may have committed this murder (laughs) Mm -hmm. um so they've never found anything but they've never found any concrete evidence on it um and several people in the investigation don't believe a diary exists so also possible yeah it's it's all a bit muddy here (laughs) Mm -hmm. so with all this going on smitty knew that he had to get rid of gretchen too Naturally. Naturally. So on August 16th, 1965, Gretchen brings her little sister, Wendy, who's 13, Uh-oh. to the drive-in to see Elvis's movie, which was mm-hmm. Tickle Me, which is released on June 3rd, 1965. Don't think I've seen that one. Oh, well, he had three movies that came out in 1965. Tickle Me, what was it? It was uh, Harem Scarum. And mm-hmm. something like Girls' Night or something like that. It was That was the most plain sounding one, so I didn't remember it. <laughs> right. So, anyway. <laughs> However, Gretchen and Wendy never return home after Uh-oh. seeing the Elvis movie. <laughs> Which hopefully they enjoyed. I mean, with a title like that, <laughs> how could you not? Right, exactly. So, the car Gretchen was driving... Uh, which was a red and white Pontiac Le Mans, was uh, found in the parking lot of the Flamingo Hotel. 
police follow a trail of reported sightings from the drive-in to several towns in Mexico. Okay. And after searching several towns there, the police give up and list them as runaways, as they tended to do in that time. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of that. <laughs> yep. Although this time they did actually, like, try to search for them. So I will give them props for that. Most of the time That's they would just good. say, Oh, you have a missing person? Oh, they're a teenager? They probably just ran away. <laughs> so, once again, as you can probably assume, Smitty starts chatting with people, letting them know that <laughs> he killed them. <laughs> so... At this point, I assume he, he, like, whenever he meets someone new, he leads with that. Like, I would assume so. I was going, my name's Smitty, whatever. Uh, I've killed four people. Yeah. <laughs> That's your lead These in. These four people specifically. Yes. <laughs> this is where I buried them. Let me bring you to the bodies, because he also tends to do that. Or at least... Oh, my God. This, with Richie, he did that, because since Richie is his new best friend, um, mm -hmm. he actually brought them, brought him to where he had tossed their bodies, and, and showed him. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, yep. <laughs> but while he was telling some people that he had killed her, he was also spread around that the girls were actually in San Diego. Okay. Which causes Smitty to end up being brought to San Diego by two guys from the mafia. <laughs> Okay. That, look, this this is wild, right? This just keeps getting... The, <laughs> the fact that the mafia heard about this before the police. <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> just funny. Right. So, in San Diego, Smitty was seen going around town with pictures of the two girls asking about their whereabouts and the two mafia guys watching over him. Okay. Why? <laughs> I don't know. Apparently there was some connection there. There was a connection to a lot of crime at that point in time, but um, I would have to assume that someone in her family had ties. Had some sort of tie. So Smitty actually ends up contacting the FBI, which is wild, <laughs> since he's <laughs> killed at least three people. Right. But the FBI guys do come, and they work with the San Diego Police Department, and they arrest the Mafia dudes. So, <laughs> yep. I mean, hey. Right? Smitty goes <laughs> home to Tucson, so. Yeah. Um, whatever works. Whatever works. Uh, Smitty had temporarily been held by the San Diego Police Department, but that was for the Mafia thing, not the murdering girls thing, so. Right. Yeah. As a witness or whatever. Yeah. But. Well. After that, he's back on his way to Tucson. Well, thank God. <laughs> I was worried he'd never see home again. Right. Oh, goodness. So, sometime after all that incident, Smitty starts seeing a new girl, once again. Mm -hmm. uh, her name is Diane Lynch, and she's 15. Yeah. Getting younger by the day. <laughs> so... On their first date, Smitty asked her to marry him. And she accepted. That's... Oh. <laughs> True love. I was going to say, that's, that's, I think that's what the kids call a red flag. <laughs> nope. She was into it. She was good. <laughs> I mean, I guess if you're 15 and this guy, this cool guy comes up to you, asks you on a date, asks you to marry him, I guess you say yes. I guess some people are into that. I guess so. Well, Smitty and Diane were married on October 24th, 1965. Smitty was 23. She was 15. It was oh. disgusting. It's not good. No. Uh, no. What, what, was, what was the legal age then? I don't know. I would uh, at least fifteen. <laughs> at least you would think that she would have to have some sort of parental permission, right? Right. And whenever that they, they ask, like, "Oh, how long have you been dating this guy?" She said, "Uh, today." Yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would uh set off a few bells. <laughs> uh, you would hope, but apparently not. Apparently not. Uh, okay. So, now we get to the downfall of Smitty. <laughs> oh, all right. And it comes in the form 
of Richie Bruins. Okay. So, Richie was real obsessed with this girl, Darlene Kirk. Um, okay. She used to date Smitty. Just like every other girl in town, it seems like. Right. Anyway. He's like Genghis Khan. God, yeah. Uh, but Richie became paranoid that Darlene was going to be the next girl that Smitty killed. For whatever reason. Right. Uh, un- uh, you know, understandable fear. <laughs> it's, yep. Yeah. Um, but due to this, he ended up staking out her house and, like, taking through her trash and stuff. Just being a real creepo. Um, yeah, it's not it's not how you attract girls, fellas, or ladies no. out there looking for a, a girlfriend. Um, Please do not dig through other ladies' trash. <laughs> no. and Or spy on them. Or, or spy on them. Or stake out their house. No. That's <laughs> what good stalkers one. do. <laughs> that, and yes. People ain't real big on dating the stalkers. <laughs> no. Girls don't like stalkers. I don't think guys like stalkers either. No one's a big fan of the That's stalker. That's true. No. Guys also don't like stalkers. No don't one likes up. stalkers. Yeah. Please do not stalk your love interest. Just not talk cool. to them. Just yeah. go up, find a common interest, start out slow. It might turn out that you don't actually like them in the end. It's better to know yeah. than to stalk. It, at the very <laughs> least, be creepy to their face. Right. <laughs> Anyway, um, so, uh, obviously Darlene's dad wasn't a big old fan of him creeping around her house. I don't think Darlene yeah. was a big old fan either. Um, no, so probably not. It ended up with, uh, Richie having to move to Ohio to live with his grandma because of a restraining order. He wasn't allowed to be in town. Okay. So, um. That's an effective restraining order. Right? They apparently had... Very effective restraining orders in the 60s. Couldn't be bothered to investigate missing teenagers, but they had a hell of a restraining order. Like, yeah, 23-year-old marry a 15-year-old, go for it. But you can't go with 500 feet, because we know this guy has binoculars, so (laughs) so just kick him out of town. There you go. (laughs) But... Maybe due to the fact that he felt that he couldn't protect Darlene from so far away, uh, Richie ends up telling the police everything about Smitty's murders. So, At least he was committed to, yep, to her. Yep. Good for him, I guess, in the creepiest way possible. Yeah. Well, he hadn't <laughs> assisted with any murders, right? No, he was just told about them. Well, and shown okay. where the bodies were. And stalked a girl, which again, not and cool. And stalked a girl. Not cool. Could also a crime. <laughs> also a crime. Um, but Richie also told the police about Mary and John's involvement. So he got everyone in one go. Well, that's good. And the police fly him back to Tucson to show uh, them the locations of the bodies. So he yeah, gets to. That's, that's why be you don't show town. bodies to people. <laughs> right? No to any murderers listening. Don't show people bodies. <laughs> Let's not give the murderers any fun facts or fun tips or... Well, hopefully I shouldn't have to tell them. Well, hopefully no one murders anyone. With today's technology, you'll be caught right away, so don't even try it, bucko. That is true. There you go. That is very true. So, on November 10th of 1965, the skeletons of the Fritz sisters were found uh, in the desert north of the city. I don't have a specific location for them, just desert north of the city. Right. When they were found... Uh, the bodies weren't buried. They were just sitting on a hill near a road, like, waiting to be found. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That... Yeah. <laughs> anyway. I mean, like, a wooded area? Sure. Right. <laughs> but in a desert. Like, in come a desert. On. Yeah. It's, it's one thing when you drop, you know, someone in a ditch where there's shrubs or other things kind of blocking the way. Yeah. Desert, you got quite but, a bit of, of, you know, sight line there. You yeah, got <laughs> some real bit. estate to yeah. <laughs> look out over. Or at least half-heartedly bury them or something. Just not right on top yeah, of the hill. At least, like, dig a hole and chuck them in. Like, just a little old ditch. Something. So they won't be seen on the Honestly. horizon line. <laughs> well, <laughs> a, you know what? Apparently, it, it worked for him because they were found in November and they have been killed in uh, July. So... I mean, that's that's not bad. Right? No one else apparently <laughs> noticed or reported the bodies. And they only they only found the bodies because 
Ricky or whatever. Richie. Richie had told them. Told them, yeah. These God. People are <laughs> just wild. Yeah. <laughs> so, it was assumed that they were strangled because there was no sign that they had been beaten or shot. Mm-hmm. But, you know, kind of hard to tell. But that's what it was assumed. There were clothing remnants on one body, but not the other. But at this point, they couldn't tell whether one or both of them had been raped. So, yeah, unknown. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to make a swing and say probably probably at least Gretchen, at least Gretchen, probably also Wendy. Yeah, probably because he was gross. Yeah, real gross. Ugh. He was just the worst. Anyway. Ugh. Yeah, so, ew. yep. But that same day, November 10th, um, around noon, Smitty saw a car slowly circling the block. He thought it was the Mafia coming back for him. Uh, Honestly, <laughs> I'd be worried too. If right? I were him. Yeah. Already got him once. He, like, are the, the, the cops' findings aren't, like, public yet? Uh, no, because it's that same day. So, like, they had just found the bodies. Okay. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, safe to assume it's <laughs> the mob and not the police. <laughs> yep. So, being a bit worried, he went inside. Um, mm-hmm. However, the car actually belonged to the police. There to arrest him. Yep. So, as they're dragging Smitty out of his house, uh, he's mm-hmm. yelling at his wife to get his mom. <laughs> 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 because his mom would take care of everything for him. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's just such a good mental image. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Getting Especially dragged into a Big old car. mole, those big old cowboy boots he was wearing, hair slicked back. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Both arms, he has a police officer dragging him out of the, <laughs> the house and he's screaming, Get my mom! Get my mom! <laughs> How'd he get ma? <laughs> this oh, fucking goodness. cartoon character. Yeah. <laughs> Yelling yeah. his wife. This, that his mom is gonna take care of it for him. He's yep. Johnny Bravo. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, you know what? He was kind of right because when the police tried to get back into the house to search it, Smitty's mom refused to let him in without a warrant. So <laughs> I don't think that's hard to get. But hey, no. He, he at least he asked for the right person. <laughs> exactly. And also, if people come or the police come to search your stuff. Make sure they have a warrant. That's, yes, very true. Do because, not let a cop in just because they're wearing a uniform. Exactly. I always check for a warrant. Unless your son's just been arrested for murder. Then. Then you know, maybe let him in. Maybe. Just, <laughs> you know, be like, just his room. <laughs> yeah. Just this once. Just this once. Just his room. If you want Don't the rest of the house, you gotta have a warrant. warrant. <laughs> yeah. That's how warrants work. <laughs> well, a lot of times they do have specific, like, things, because the judge has to sign off of it on it, right? So they'll be like, right. okay, you can only search this room or something like that, and that gets in the way a lot of the time, too. Hmm. Um, Didn't know that. Yep. So, Mary French was arrested in Belton, Texas, brought back to Tucson. John mm-hmm. Saunders was arrested in Westbrook, Connecticut, and brought back to Tucson. So. Imagine that came with a uh, dishonorable discharge. I'm not sure. Probably. If he was still in the Navy, I would assume so. Uh, I, I mean, do not know only, his status. It's only, what, four years after? Three? Uh, like a Three year years? after. So, yeah, I would assume he was still serving. Yeah, because typically, at least back then, it was four years, right? That's what I thought, yeah. So... Yes, I would assume he was dishonorably discharged. I would hope he was dishonorably discharged. Yeah. So. One would hope. <laughs> so, the police brought Mary and John out to find the body of Roe. Um, and they searched mm-hmm. for several days, but they were only able to find her curlers. Couldn't find her body. Okay. Yep. Were they? Were they not with her body? I will. Explain okay. later. Okay. There's some drama <laughs> involved. Out. Some drama. Oh. Okay. Um, so John was charged with first degree murder 
and Mary was charged with being an accessory to murder and compounding and concealing said murder. Right. Uh, both pled guilty. S- smart of them. Yes, as they should. Both said that they would testify against Smitty in his trials. So, John's lawyer does a little finagling in his mind, I guess, and figured it would be better to plead guilty to first-degree murder, since Mm -hmm. at the time in Arizona, if he was sentenced to life, he would be eligible eligible for parole uh, within seven to eight years. But with second degree, it was a minimum of ten years. So, apparently it's better to get life in prison. Um, but at that time, the average time served for first degree murder was 12 to 15 years. So this seemed like a dumb move. Right. But that's what the the lawyer decided. So, so he pled guilty to second degree. He pled guilty to first degree. Because (laughs) parole would be eligible. So he started out pleading to first degree. Yes, he started out pleading guilty to first degree okay. murder, because that's not smart. <laughs> according this lawyer's playing this dumbest game of forty chess, um, yeah. he thought that you know with with first degree, if you're sentenced to life, you could be eligible for parole within seven to eight years. But if mm-hmm. he went with second degree, he had to be in there for at least ten years, minimum ten years. So he was hoping I mean, that he could get parole in seven years. <laughs> Looking at a numbers game, it makes sense. Right. But but you have to have all the paper, numbers. <laughs> well, also that's eligible for parole, so that's not yes. even that's not a guaranteed. guarantee. No. Yeah. 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 Because and like I said, you have to have all the numbers too. Because just because he's eligible for parole in seven to eight years doesn't mean he will get it. Because the average time served for first degree murder at the time don't know what the numbers are now. Um, was right. 12 to 15 years. So that's more than 10 years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look. Maybe this guy was actually playing 4D chess. And he he wanted uh, John put away. And yeah. so he said, hey, check out this deal. I mean, he was <laughs> guilty. Just, yeah, exactly. Yeah, could be. He's like, hey, I don't want this guy on the streets. I've got a daughter. Right. <laughs> Something, could I don't be. know. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to trick this guy and lock him up. Yeah. Well, it happens. Yep. <laughs> so, around December 21st of 1965, Mary was sentenced to 4 to 5 years in prison. Mm-hmm. Um her lawyer tried to get her probation, but the judge refused. Yeah, uh, no. Nah, that's yeah. pretty light for a Yeah. <laughs> homicide. Yeah. Well, she was just the accessory. Um, Still. Still. (laughs) Accessory to first degree murder. Exactly. Um, John was sentenced to life in prison. Mm -hmm. And at his lawyer's request, John started his sentence the day after Christmas. So, 26th of December, he went on to the state prison there in Arizona. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't think he got to spend his Christmas with his family, but at least I guess he was in town. So I guess, yeah. So, now we start Smitty's oh. trial for Gretchen and Wendy Fritz. Mm-hmm. So he hasn't been indicted for um, the first one yet. For Rose? Rose, that's right. No, I don't believe so. Not at this time. Definitely okay. the Fritz sisters, but they mm-hmm. were trying to get the body, I believe, of Roe. Right. Um, however, spoilers, I guess, they do bring him to trial before they find the body. So mm-hmm. at some point they're like, yeah, this guy did it. Probably because, you know, the testimony they have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you have testimonies from the other guy that killed her and yeah. her accomplice, I mean, that's pretty, uh-huh. that's pretty open and shut. You would hope. So before the trial even starts, Smitty's lawyer, whose name is William Tinney, um... I like that name. Yeah, solid name. Uh, he was claiming that the news coverage would prevent Smitty and Mary and John as well um, from having fair trials. Mm-hmm. Um, and had even prejudiced the jury against them before the trial started. Right. However, that didn't stop the media from printing 
whatever they wanted to. Rumors, suspicions, just <laughs> stuff they wanted to say. Whatever they said, they would print it out there for them. On brand, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Even back in the 60s. Yep. Anyway. Um, so jury selection for the trial started on February 15th, 1966. Mm -hmm. um, the selection was made more difficult because the jury would be sequestered during the trial, which mm -hmm. this was fairly rare back then, apparently, the, the jury being sequestered like that. Right. So it was fairly difficult to get them picked out. But they were able to get enough people, eight women, four men, with one woman, one man as reserve jurors. Um, and so... Trial's ready to get started. Tinney's defense plan was to try and make it seem like Richie was the real murderer. And he was trying to pin the blame on Smitty. Because Richie I mean, knew where the bodies were, right? That's suspicious. Right. I mean, that's... It's not a bad idea if you know your defendant's guilty. Right. <laughs> not a whole lot of options you can go with here, but he's doing his yeah. best. I mean, it's either um, that or insanity. Yeah. yeah. Well, despite how he looks, I don't know if he could get that. <laughs> yep. Um, Tinny also continued to push hard about the media influencing the outcome of the trial. Mm -hmm. So he was pushing for that and Richie. <laughs> so he had Gretchen's mother testify that Gretchen wasn't afraid of Smitty, but was afraid of Richie. Um, oh, right. Yes. So, apparently she didn't like Richie very much for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And Tenny was using Maybe that. Maybe she heard against... he was stalking some girl. Well, you know, <laughs> it's right. <laughs> yeah. Then again, she's dating a guy who confessed to murder. So. Also true. <laughs> like, he confessed to her. This wasn't hearsay that yeah, he had yeah. murdered someone. Like, uh, okay, all right. Anyway. Yeah. Um, the defense also had Paul Jinn, uh, which was someone who had hung out with Smitty, testify mm -hmm. uh, against Richie, and also claim that there was no diary. Because that was another thing in this trial, right. is the diary. <laughs> and how did they know about the diary? Um, did Gretchen because, talk to the group of friends? So, what it was is, Richie knew about the diary, because Smitty told Richie about it. Okay. And so Richie told... The police, I suppose, about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. About this alleged diary. Yeah. Um, so, Smitty's mom, here in the courtroom as well, she claims that she never saw a diary, um, and that her word should be trusted, because she went to Smitty's house two or three times a day and cleaned his house weekly. So she was there all the time and had never mm -hmm. seen a diary. Okay. Yep. So, on the prosecutor side of things, we have William Schaefer III. Um, okay. Also an excellent name. Also, they're both named William, which is fun. Yes. <laughs> so, on the prosecutor side, uh, their argument was that the Fritzes, <laughs> that's hard to say, um, were killed to cover up any murders that Smitty committed, which would be Rose for sure, and then this mm -hmm. potential one in the diary. This potential male victim. Yes. Um, so, Mary French comes and testifies about, you know, killing Roe, which was mm -hmm. admitted um, in Gretchen and Wendy's trial um, because it would be motive for this murder. Right. Um, however, John refused to testify, even though he said he would, probably because he was upset about his sentencing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would be too. Yeah, I just put a bad Yelp review for that lawyer. Just, God, the yeah, worst. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a one star right <laughs> <Yeah>. there. <laughs> All right, so, also on the prosecutor's side, they had a witness, someone named Fields, don't know the first name. Um, okay. but he was someone who had briefly lived with Smitty. Oh, okay. Yep. So he testified that Smitty had told him about the diary, 
with the account of uh, killing the guy and mm-hmm. that it had been stolen by Gretchen. Oh, okay. Also that Smitty had made death threats against, against Gretchen. <laughs> so That's, Sounds about right. Yep. Yeah. However, unfortunately, Smitty never gave any names, dates, or locations uh, for this alleged fourth murder, so can't confirm it. <laughs> right. So, really unfortunate there. Yeah. There's also a girl, Irene Holt, gave a similar testimony to Fields, saying that the diary existed and he had death threats and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So, in total, the prosecution had about 30 witnesses that testified against Smitty. <laughs> okay. Yep. I mean, that's how many people he told, so it's right? not surprising. Yeah, they finally like, oh, guess it's time to give up the goose. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that that's... <laughs> Boy, <laughs> if that doesn't describe the phrase, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's... <laughs> so, um, right before his sentencing... Smitty demands to be injected with truth serum, truth serum, okay. to prove that he was innocent. Not how that works. The judge refused um, because the request had to have been made before the trial started, not right before the jury's about to announce the verdict. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, a bit late to the swing on that. Yeah, just just a tad. So, the jury took two hours and ten minutes to reach a verdict of guilty, and since Yeah, it's, that's, uh... Yeah. I don't know why it even took them sure. that long. I assume that they had to give an appearance of not walking in, immediately going guilty, and walking back out. <laughs> had some coffee or something. Yeah, I mean, maybe one of them was like, oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it was Richie, <laughs> and then everyone was like, no, shut up. Right. Oh, goodness. So... Smitty was di- uh, sentenced to death by gas chamber. Hmm. Yes. Old school. Old school. Uh, the trial ended around March 1st of 1966. Smitty's trial for the murder of Eileen Rao. Rowe. Eileen Rowe. <laughs> One day I'm going to get her name right. <laughs> was <Someday>. originally... <laughs> it's because her name has an E on the end. And so I always want to say Rao instead of Rowe for some reason. Really? Yeah. I figured it was R O W. It's R O W E. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so Smitty's trial for the murder of Eileen Rowe was originally scheduled for March fifteenth. However, that was pushed back to October fourth of nineteen sixty six, and then mm-hmm. that was pushed back again to April third of nineteen sixty seven, and uh, one last time to May ninth, nineteen sixty seven. Okay. Uh, the problem for Smitty was that he was set to be executed on June 17th of 1966. Uh, so, <laughs> but due to his trial being postponed, his death sentence was also postponed. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so on June 10th, 1966, Smitty's wife, Diane, remember her? She's 15. Uh, That's right. How could yes. I forget? Yes. Uh, but she filed for divorce and wanted her maiden name back. And I don't blame her. Can't blame her. No. I, I never saw anything saying whether she did or not succeed in that, but I assume she did. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> she had pretty good reason. Yes. So, Smitty's parents, or at least his mom, because at this point I believe his uh, mom and dad were separated, and mm-hmm. his dad did not seem to put up with a whole lot of his, his shit, so <laughs> not like his mom. Um, so this might have just been his mom that set up a fund a fund for the defense fees and mm-hmm. by golly she managed to raise $36 um <laughs> which today is about $290 Jesus. so right <laughs> more than i was expecting yeah i was thinking like okay like 80 or something yeah no but on July 16th 1966 it was reported that F. Lee Bailey was going to join Smitty's legal team. Um, I, know that name. I think I know that name. Yes. Um, I will get to that in just a moment, where you might know him mm-hmm. from. So he was going to assist Tinny with 
Smitty's legal defense. He's not the main mm. lawyer for this anymore. Right. Or, um, he's an assistant. He's the assistant. Um, so Bailey was known for his successful appeal to the conviction of Dr. Sh- Sam Shepard. Ah, that's where I know him from. <laughs> that's where you know him from. Because that, he got the conviction reversed at the U.S. Supreme Court due to the press mm-hmm. not allowing a fair trial. Right. Which is what Tenney was pushing for, for Smitty. And now they're getting they Bailey the right on guy. this. Yeah. Yeah. So... Bailey goes in expecting an easy win because the media was very Everywhere. prejudiced. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so we start the trial for Eileen Rowe. It began May 9th of 1967. Mm-hmm. Uh, jury selection took seven days, which again was in part due to the jurors being sequestered during the trial. Right. Um, so the defense was trying to make a deal with the prosecution to get the charges reduced to second-degree murder. And, after a bit of back and forth, prosecution agrees. He already got a death He's sentence. He's already got death, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so, then, after we get the second-degree charge, the defense tries to get Smitty to change his plea to guilty. But Smitty refuses and almost fires his lawyer's <laughs> Before his... Why? I don't know, because Smitty's dumber than a rock. (laughs) I mean, if this was your first trial, sure. Right. But you're already convicted, and you had your death, (laughs) your execution date postponed. Right. It's happening. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Like... Yeah. Um... So he was... He was talked down from firing his lawyers. He he still employed his lawyers at that point. (laughs) Um... So, trial continued on, and uh, Mary French gave her testimony again. Uh-huh. John refused to testify again. Um, Fair. However, this time the judge took John's preliminary hearing statements as a substitute to his uh, testimony. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> so, at this point, the defense knew they were fucked. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um... And Bailey ended up calling out sick. <laughs> I love that dude. <laughs> yeah, he he I saw mean, I where the tides him were going. The Shepherd case, but <laughs> <laughs> that's just great. He like, saw oh, which way. Sorry, the... I've got. <laughs> I'm not feeling good. Yeah, can't make it can't to the sentencing. It. Yeah, oh, just took his paycheck and ran. <laughs> yep. If he even got one, they only got thirty six dollars to pay the defense. Anyway. That's true. Yeah, because at first, I don't I don't think I said this, but at first, Bailey was like, I'm only going to take this case if you raise the funds to pay me for it. Mm-hmm. And uh, they did, and then he's like, well, all right, I'll do it anyway. And uh, <laughs> then this ends up happening. <laughs> so. Right. I mean, he's like, hey, this, this has got my name on it. I don't yeah. want to be involved in this anymore. I'm mm-hmm. out. Yep. Ugh. Oh, goodness. Well, so, yeah, I hope he comes up in more more cases. Yeah. <laughs> So, Smitty's lawyers just are like, you have to plead guilty, because the mm-hmm. jury is ready to strangle you right here. <laughs> yeah. They are signing that death warrant as we yeah. speak. I mean, he's he's wasting time. Yeah. That's all he's doing. Yeah. Uh, so, Smitty was still resistant, but he finally caved and pled guilty to second-degree murder. <laughs> Good. However. Uh-oh. <laughs> In June... Here we go. (laughs) Smitty asked for a new trial due to his feeling uh, that his lawyers had coerced him into pleading guilty. And he... they did. (laughs) (laughs) To to his benefit. (laughs) Is he just trying to get a stay of execution for as long as he can? I think he's just stupid. (laughs) (laughs) But... (laughs) Either's possible at this point. Right. Probably both. <laughs> probably both. We'll go with probably both. Um, so in in this letter, I believe that he writes to the judge, just judicial branch in general. I don't know who he writes it to. <laughs> he includes personal attacks against his lawyers, the press, 
and his former friends who were testifying against him. <laughs> it was apparently <laughs> like die. 38 pages long. I mean, hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's about how long your notes for this were. Yeah, it's true. Oh, goodness. But mine wasn't full of personal attacks. Well, right. a little bit of personal attacks <laughs> against Smitty. It's not hard to personally attack this it's, guy. He's a fucking moron. Yeah. So, uh, after that, <laughs> his lawyers asked to withdraw their counsel. <laughs> which what? It was approved. They were no longer his co- counsel after this. <laughs> I mean, hey, he got what he wanted. Yep. Um, also, Smitty's plea change was not granted, uh, and he was sentenced to 50 years to life. Right. So, Smitty tries to sweeten the deal a little. He says, in return he for a new trial, he offered to show them mm-hmm. where Rose's body was to prove that, he, that she had not been killed via the blows to the head uh, that the testimony had stated. And okay. He knew where the body was, and the others right. didn't, because mm-hmm. he had gone back and moved the body without anyone's knowing. Uh, yeah. Clever. <laughs> Should one... have done that with the sisters, too. Yeah, the, the one clever thing he's done, and it's like a last minute trying to <laughs> escape a life sentence after he's already been sentenced to death? I don't yeah. know. And... Also, he left the curlers. So, like, yeah. it's like, oh, she was here. She was here. <laughs> oh, goodness. Jesus. So, the police take him out to the desert, and he uses a, a saguaro cactus as a landmark. Mm-hmm. Tried okay. two locations, and he found her remains. So, he was good. right there up on the end, uh, uptick there. <laughs> so, good, good. Um,. Which, uh, Roe was finally laid to rest in Colorado at her mother's request. So, she didn't have to be anywhere near Tucson. That's good. Yeah. Um, so, unfortunately for Smitty, the Mm -hmm. autopsy confirmed the testimony. uh, So, no retrial was granted. (laughs) I mean, if you're going to make that claim, Mm -hmm. then, like, whenever you're moving the body, just, like... (laughs) Put a bullet in her head or something, right. you know? Like, just give him, uh, give him a, ba- a pause, you know? Yeah. So, uh... <laughs> now, you know Smitty's no quitter, so he appealed his convictions... Oh, I know. <laughs> he appealed his convictions up to the Arizona Supreme Court. However, the convictions are always upheld, <laughs> so... <laughs> Good. Yeah. So... Sometime around that time, Arizona had abolished the death penalty temporarily. So, his death sentences were commuted to life sentences. So, he had, Mm -hmm. like, three life sentences on him. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Probably wasn't going to get parole. I hope not. (laughs) So, Smitty was sent to the Arizona State Prison, where Mm -hmm. he continued to be a nuisance. (laughs) (laughs) No surprise there. Yeah. Um... So, on October 12th of 1972, Smitty went missing, uh, even though he was in max security. He still went missing. <laughs> I mean, he was a small guy. He was a gymnast, you yeah, know? Yeah, little boy. He anyway. spit through the bars in his <laughs> little, little mousy boy. Yeah. Um, so, the police set up roadblocks uh, outside the prison, and officers searched inside and outside the prison. Uh, he was found three hours later. In a 15 inch wide by 12 inch deep clothing locker in the prison weld shop. <laughs> so did he get did he get put in there by the bullies? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, was he put in there? Well, he might have been. He he actually got there by hiding out in a hollowed out gymnastics horse, um, which four men had carried the horse to the workshop, and it wasn't known whether the foreman knew that he was in there or not. So. <laughs> They might have, y- yeah. I uh, they might have stuffed him in the the horse to begin with, and then stuffed him in the oh locker my, after that. Oh my god! <laughs> I hope that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> this dude, <laughs> he gets bullied in high school probably because he's short. Yeah. And then he gets to prison. He's like, 
Well, it can't get any worse. <laughs> <laughs> like a dweeb. Yeah. <laughs> Take his lunch money and stuff him in the locker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Oh, my God. So, there was another escape attempt where he tried to fake yes. his suicide, uh, but that also oh. failed. So. Okay. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. So I don't on... think he was smart enough to pull off one of those. No. <laughs> but on November 12th of 1972, Smitty attempts another escape, uh, <laughs> this time succeeding. Uh, oh. This time with a Third another triple... Charm. Yeah. But this time he's with another triple murderer, Ray Hudgens. Oh, good. So we got the triple mo- murder brothers right here. Uh... Yeah. That's... Okay. Uh... <laughs> Good pair to escape. Yep. So, the prison noticed that they were missing about 4 p.m. Uh, that night, sometime that night, Smitty and Ray broke into a home uh, armed with a homemade twenty-two caliber zip gun. Which, if okay. you don't know what a zip gun is, it's like a homemade gun where you use like a bunch of rubber bands as the, you know, the, the force to push whatever you're propelling. Yeah, like the... The hammer, essentially. Yeah, sort of, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, they were in prison, so... I mean, yeah, but... What What are they armed with? Like, a pencil? Are they going full high school with this? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Make a little crossbow out of paper and rubber bands, shooting pencils into the ceiling to piss off the math teacher, like... Well, you know what? They they do have some pretty impressive, you know, prison-made weapons, if you've ever seen some of those. Those are pretty impressive, but I don't know they, what they were like they in the 60s. Some... <laughs> yeah, and knowing, uh... Knowing, knowing our Smitty. Smith, yeah. I don't think he was... He was, uh... I don't think he was programming AI for in here. No. <laughs> so... Uh, they ended up actually taking a man who had been sleeping in the home hostage, uh, mm-hmm. and then also two more men and a woman who showed up Jeez. at the house later. <laughs> they had four hostages at that point. Um, the little pea shooters. <laughs> yeah. So they forced their hostages to drive them to Tempe, which is a sur- suburb of Phoenix and about 57 miles away from the prison. Okay. Uh, and when they got there, Smitty Ray just... Got out and walked off. Let the hostages go. Sure. Yeah. So Not smart, but obviously the hostages sure. told the police what had happened. I mean, I don't know if they would have been able to kill all four of them. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Smitty was on uh, on the run for two days before he was apprehended. He was found in a railroad by a Southern Pacific Railroad employee named Bill Lanier, um, who. Uh, actually went to high school with Smitty, and so recognized him. Well, how about that? How about that? Gotta love reunions with people you went to high school with. Absolutely, just so <laughs> dramatic. Yeah. That's, that's some 310 to Yuma shit. <laughs> um, so, even though Smitty is dumb, uh, mm-hmm. he, he had tried to alter his appearance, uh, <laughs> He had dyed I mean, his. He could just take off all his makeup and. He... Well, person. I don't think he was wearing his makeup at that point, right? I, I don't think not. they allow it in prison. <laughs> yeah. Um. So he had dyed his hair red, but was also mm-hmm. wearing a blonde wig on top of that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Why? I don't know. <laughs> it's Smitty. Who knows what he's thinking? <laughs> what? What's his natural hair color? Uh, it's like brownish red. So okay. he dyed it red and then put a blonde wig over that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Yep. I mean, I guess if it's a convincing wig, sure. then you could like but transition gonna... with it. Mm. I'm, gonna I'm, go I'm not giving this guy. I'm not no, giving him the benefit of the doubt. I doubt that he had a convincing wig. <laughs> no, no, it was he probably, probably a mop. I was going to say, he probably found some straw in a field and put that on top of his head. <laughs> so, um, in the end, he was returned to the Arizona State Prison. Good. 
Oh, in uh, 1940, or 1974, excuse me, uh, Smitty legally changed his name to Paul David Ashley because he thought uh, it was bad for his image and rehabilitation to be, to, for his old name to be kept, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, however. Bad for his image. Yeah. But uh, everyone, especially in the media, just continued, continued to refer to him as Charles Smith. Uh, mm -hmm. So, didn't work. Didn't really work. Yeah. No. Um, oh, this part's exciting. Um, oh. On March 20th of 1975, uh, Smitty is shanked between 14 and 24 <laughs> times in the head and chest by fellow inmates. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean <laughs> Okay. Yep. Sure. Did he I'm I assume he lived. So this part gets a little gross because I'm gonna go into a little bit of details of, of his wounds. So if Tell you're me. faint of heart, just tune out for a minute. Yeah. So he was stabbed in the eye, lung, abdomen, intestines. Uh, he ended up severing his uh, ureter, which are the tubes that connect the kidneys to the bladder, and he had several other superficial wounds. Jeez. Uh, due to his injuries, Smitty's eye had to be removed, and his lung had to be stitched up. However, he ended up developing a blood infection and needed a tracheotomy. Tra tracheotomy. Tracheotomy. Fuck. Yes, tracheotomy. Tra fuck, I can't say it. You say it. <laughs> tracheotomy tracheotomy to help him breathe. <laughs> Hopefully Thanks. I said it w right at least once in there for you. <laughs> that last one was pretty close. There we go. Uh, also, his kidneys failed. So... I mean, that's that's an effective stabbing. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think <laughs> he was stabbed crazy. enough that... <laughs> yeah, I mean, using prison tools. Yep. Getting the old Caesar treatment. <laughs> yep. So, uh, Smitty died ten days after being admitted to the hospital. Oh, wow, okay. Yep. Uh, I mean, he makes sense. Yep. Uh, he was 32. <laughs> he That's was insane. Only 32. <laughs> <laughs> That's... Yeah. So what What was the cause of death? Was it the kidney failure? Uh, there were so many issues right there because he had the blood infection. He couldn't breathe. <laughs> you know, the kidneys failing. Just yeah. none of it was looking good. <laughs> Not a good look, but you know, yeah. I don't want to say he deserved it, but he, he deserved it. You said it. I did. And I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Dude was a scumbag. He was the <laughs> grossest guy. Just the not, worst. Not, not quite as, not quite as funny as old Audrey, but. No. But Audrey boy. was also not great because she murdered her husband and, you know, tried to murder her daughter but mm -hmm. she didn't date teenagers <laughs> you know that is true <laughs> she just tried to kill them <laughs> oh goodness uh so he ended up being buried in the prison cemetery because his mother was worried that if his grave was in a public graveyard it would be uh defiled and defaced all the time most likely which I would think it would have to be. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like contractual obligation. <laughs> right. It's like as soon as you find out, you're like, oh man, I gotta go kick over Smitty's grave. <laughs> yeah, make anyway. a night of it with your buds. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, so in case you were wondering, the two guys, two inmates that shanked Smitty were Jimmy Farah and uh, Dennis Eversole. Okay. Uh, they were both in prison for violent crimes. Uh, Farah really? for second second degree murder and assault with a deadly weapon, and uh, Eversole was five counts of armed robbery. <laughs> well, they so. both lived up to their charges. Yes, uh, they also got extra time for you know shanking Smitty. So. <laughs> yeah, but it was only to be served concurrently, so right. not really. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> so the chief of prison security believed that. Smitty was attacked for backing out of a, an escape plan. Mm. So he couldn't speak, right? He couldn't 
Right. Snitch. Yep. Um. So although, we're gonna... let oh, me ahead. say, Smitty mm -hmm. backing out of an escape plan. Right. Which is, is very out of character for him. Right. Like it must have been a wild plan for Smitty not to be yeah. on board. Yeah. If Smitty's like, this isn't going to work, guys. <laughs> you know, you got to go back to the whiteboard. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, goodness. So, I'm going to end on uh, the mini works that were inspired by Smitty. Ooh, okay. Uh, so, uh, Joyce Carol Oates' 1966 short story, Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? Uh, okay. The 1986 film, Smooth Talk. The I don't think I've seen that. Yep. 1971 film, The Todd Killings. Uh, the 1994 film Dead Beat, the 2005 film The Lost, the 2014 film Dawn, and Emily Ross's thriller Half in Love with Death. Hmm. So, all those I don't had. Think I've seen any of those, but. Yeah. All of those had some form of inspiration from Smitty and his just wild behavior and murders. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's what I got this time. Well, before we stop, I gotta look up a picture of this dude. Is yes. Yeah. Uh, Charles. Charles Howard Schmid. S C H uh, I M I D. There we go. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see the one with, with the bandage on his nose? Yeah. Yeah, oh, it's gross. It like that? Yeah. Ew. Yeah. He looks he looks fake. Yes. I mean he was. He was very like, fake. I Oh, you should see the one where they're arresting him. You can see his boots, his giant ass cowboy boots. Oh my god. <laughs> I mean he is like big. Like he he, he... I mean, maybe he, it's just the... He was very athletic and, like, muscular. Yeah. But man. <laughs> he was a tiny man, though. Yeah, I mean, I can tell. He's, like, barely... <laughs> he's barely crossing over the roof of the police car. Mm -hmm. And that's with his boots on, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't like looking at some of these pictures. No. Because, I mean, some of them, when he doesn't have, like, the makeup and stuff on, he's not a bad-looking dude. Yeah. Like, but, <laughs> boy. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, if uh, anyone out there is curious, definitely look up a picture of him and have just your world destroyed because it's not, not a good look. Just the worst. It's not. It's not <laughs> a good look. I, you know, I can agree to that. It ain't too good. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is that all you've got? That's all I got. If you don't got any more questions... I think that's it. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that wraps up the 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 wild and crazy story of good old Charles Smitty. <laughs> uh, I mean, good riddance. Yes. <laughs> what, what's the the phrase? Good riddance to bad rubbish. That's right. But. That's that's three states off the list. Yep. Uh, next week is Arkansas, correct? Arkansas, yes. Cool. Um, and you've told me that one's a bit shorter. A bit shorter. Potentially. Uh, <laughs> potentially, depending on how much we end up discussing. It is right. another technically unsolved. Mm -hmm. So. And we talked for a while last week about yes. Yes. theories. So who knows? But that's the, the picture up on Schmitty. Uh, three states down, 47 more. Mm hmm. Or is it 46? Well, depends on how you count, I suppose. But uh, it well, we had be 50, 47. so it'd be 47. Yes. <laughs> should be 47 fun. more. Yep. All right. All right, then. See everyone next time. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, stay safe. Yes. Uh, tune in next week. Don't be Hopefully. a stalker. Do not be a stalker. Bye, everyone. If you take anything, if you take anything <laughs> away from this, don't stalk people. Also, don't date a 15-year-old. Any 15-year-olds, don't get married. <laughs> yeah.
especially to 20 year olds, but also, uh, if someone uh, tells you that they've committed a murder, please go to the police. <laughs> yeah, you are not under, like, doctor patient confidentiality. <laughs> You've got no strings. Yeah. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Goodbye, everyone. Have a lovely life. <laughs>